Goodreads, a site we love to hate. Amazing for keeping track of the books you've read and the books you want to read. Also pretty great for looking up reviews to get a variety of opinions about a book that maybe you've been struggling to get through for over a month and you're trying to decide if you should just cut your losses and DNF. But one thing Goodreads is not good at is determining the objective quality and merit of a particular book. And in no way is this more clearly demonstrated than by the Goodreads Choice Awards every single year. As many people have pointed out over many years, the average user on Goodreads is unlikely to have read every single nominee in every single category. But you can bet that if they've read even a single one, they will be voting. Now I'm not trying to pass judgment on those users. I also am a Goodreads user who loves to make my opinion known. I love to feel like I have any sway whatsoever in anything happening in this uncertain world. And I too vote without having read every single nominee. But in my own defense, I only vote if I've read at least two nominees and can pick my favorite out of the two, or if the one book I've read within the category I absolutely loved and feel deserves recognition. Would it be better if I only voted if I'd read every single nominee? Yes, of course, but at least I have some kind of code of honor. Or at least that's what I tell myself so I can sleep at night. <laughs> so we've established that the Goodreads Choice Awards, they're a popularity contest, not an objective standard of excellence. And that being said, why am I bothering to read all of the Goodreads Choice Award winners of 2021 as if it's some sort of collection of the best works published in the past calendar year? I don't think there's just one answer, but I do get some sort of twisted satisfaction out of proving to myself that just because a book wins the Goodreads Choice awards doesn't mean that it's actually a good book. This comforts me when my favorite book of the year doesn't even get nominated. I also must admit that I'm not above enjoying a hate read now and then. What can I say? I'm not a saint. <laughs> And then on the positive side of things, because there are some positives, I do enjoy giving myself reading challenges within a certain framework and exposing myself to authors that maybe I haven't tried before, even if they are super popular, potentially finding a new favorite book or new favorite author that I otherwise never would have come across. This is especially true of using the Goodreads Choice Awards winners as a reading challenge, since the awards cover quite a few genres that I don't typically read, like humor and history and biography. So with all all of that being said, let me introduce you to our Goodreads Choice Award winners of 2021, the books that I explored over the past month for the purposes of this video. Here they are in all their glory, all 17 winners of the 2021 Goodreads Choice Awards, and here are their average ratings on Goodreads. Two of these books I read prior to starting this challenge. Two of these books I'm not including in this video because they're not the first in a series. These were the books that were already on my TBR that I was interested in reading at some point. These are the books that I hadn't heard of before I took on this challenge, but once I read the synopsis, they're ones that I would have added to my TBR regardless. And these are the books that I would not have read if it weren't for this challenge. We'll start with the first category, which is adult general fiction. The winner was Beautiful World, Where Are You? by Sally Rooney. This was my first experience with this very popular author and <laughs> I'm a little afraid because I am starting this video with a very unpopular opinion. But before I invite the ire of swarms of Sally Rooney fans from all over the world into my comment section, I want to talk to you about today's video's sponsor, Ana Luisa. Y'all know that I adore Ana Luisa. I've been working with them for a few years now and I wear their jewelry literally every single day of my life. Ana Luisa makes sustainable, recycled jewelry at a fair price. They're carbon neutral and they make beautiful pieces that are perfect for layering and gifting. I love using their earrings to create a unique stack in my three piercings on either ear, as well as layering necklaces and adorning my fingers with their rings. Ana Luisa's pieces are perfect for gifting, and with Valentine's Day coming up, this is the perfect time to treat yourself or a loved one to a beautiful piece of sustainable jewelry. 
Ana Luisa prioritizes sustainable materials both in their jewelry itself and in their packaging. I love that Ana Luisa gives jewelry new life by recycling gold from previous jewelry into their new pieces. This time of year is all about loving ourselves and others, and giving jewelry as a symbol of love is a classic for a reason. For Valentine's Day, Ana Luisa is having a buy one, get one 40% off sale. Be sure to check out Ana Luisa's buy one, get one 40% off sale for Valentine's Day. The website will be linked in the description box and in the pinned comment, so you can get yourself and your loved ones the perfect gift. Again, that's buy one, get one 40% off from Ana Luisa. Thank you so much to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this video. And now, without further ado, Let's get into angering Sally Rooney fans from all over the world. <laughs> Beautiful World, Where Are You by Sally Rooney was the general adult fiction winner of the Goodreads 2021 Choice Awards. And I was going to start by giving a general synopsis, explaining what the book's about for anyone who is unfamiliar, saving my personal thoughts for a little bit later. But I fear that my thoughts will be all too clear on my face. So I'm just going to start by saying I hated this book. I hated it so deeply, so viscerally, that it is almost without compare. <laughs> and perhaps in that way, this book was a winner, just not in the way that I had been led to believe. <laughs> now, before I continue, disclaimer, just because I didn't like a book doesn't mean that I am judging those who do like a book. People have different tastes. That is all great and good and amazing. I love books that other people hate and I'm fine with it. So please don't feel that I'm attacking you or your taste when I talk about books that I don't like in this video. There is space for all of us to like different books and that's what makes the world interesting. Okay, that being said, I hated this book with a burning passion and I don't understand why Sally Rooney is so popular. <laughs> I feel like I somehow missed the memo on Sally Rooney. Clearly I am behind on getting into her work, but I just feel like something is missing, some context that I need to be able to decipher this book. I also kind of feel like an alien from a completely different area of the universe that's just landed on Earth and been told, here, this is Earth literature, and trying to read it through just utter confusion and bafflement. Clearly so many people have loved this book. It has so many five-star reviews on Goodreads. I just... I don't know. It was one of the most painful reading, or in this case, listening experiences that I have ever had in my life. So what is Beautiful World Where Are You about? This is a contemporary novel set in Ireland and our protagonist, Alice, who has written two popular novels, not unlike Sally Rooney herself, had a mental breakdown and moved to the country. And her best friend, Eileen, who has been in love with a childhood friend for her entire life, and they have this on and off again, friends with benefits sort of relationship. And Alice and Eileen, being best friends, write each other very long philosophical emails about whatever comes to mind. And those emails are interspersed with descriptions of what they're getting up to with their respective love interests in their respective towns. There are many things I disliked about this book, and I'm not sure I can really think of any positives. So if you're a fan of this book, you might want to skip to the next. Let me read you my first bullet point of notes on this book that I took while listening to the audiobook. Boring, pretentious, too much monologuing, and dry over descriptions of layouts of rooms and other pointless shit. <laughs> And yeah, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much this book. I've seen many people in their reviews talking about how they either loved the emails and wished that that had been the whole book and didn't really care about the sort of real time descriptions of what Eileen and Alice were going through. I've also seen the opposite where people hated the emails and would have much rathered just stay in the regular narrative. I am one who hated both equally. <laughs> The emails are ridiculously pretentious and are so clearly a vehicle for the author to just spew all of her various opinions on whatever comes to mind that she didn't want to put the effort into actually weaving into the narrative of her novel. It's like she decided she had a lot of things to say about a lot of different things. And instead of doing what most authors have done before her, which is either write essays or articles with her opinions and share them for people to read, or write some sort of fictional novel that ties those ideas in through its themes to get her ideas across. 
She instead decided that she wanted to write a story that was pretty much completely unrelated to any of these ideas or themes, and then just cut at random times and spew all of her opinions in between, even though they had nothing to do with anything else that was happening. And as you can tell, I did not appreciate that. <laughs> personally. So the emails, not a fan. Now I will say some of the ideas that she was talking about are interesting. There are things that I would like to read about, but not like this. I would read an article. I would read a nonfiction book about it. I would have a conversation with a friend about insert topic here, but I don't want to read a fictional character that is a very thin veil for this author. Just saying all of her opinions apropos of nothing. As for the story itself, there isn't much of one. It's a lot of characters being really awful to each other and miscommunicating and then being more awful and then miscommunicating again and then really awkwardly descriptive sex scenes all told with an uber robotic narrative voice that just felt so lacking in any kind of emotion or passion or soul. It's like this book was written and narrated by Siri just conveying the information in the most robotic way possible. Not only are the characters super unlikable and just awful to each other, but they also come across way younger than they're supposed to be, which is just a huge pet peeve of mine. They are very immature and they also don't feel like distinct characters. I could not tell you the differences between Eileen and Alice because they are literally the same person. And while the two male characters are more distinct in their personality traits, they still all spoke with the same voice. Everything is so blandly described, it is just utterly soulless and dull. So dull, in fact, that it took me weeks to finish listening to the audiobook at three times speed. I would have to take a break after every five minutes or so because I would just get so viscerally angry. I would feel this heat in my stomach and my face would get warm just because everyone was so pretentious, everything was so boring, and nothing was happening. There is literally a passage in this novel where Sally Rooney explains in excruciating detail what Google Maps looks like on a phone. There's also a portion where she describes that someone took a pregnancy test by taking off the plastic covering and peeing on a stick. Because clearly we needed to be reminded that you have to open a package before you pee on the stick. Very important for the narrative. Also, something that maybe doesn't apply to all readers, since a lot of people in the world are religious in some way, shape, or form, but I'm personally an atheist, and I must say, I don't love it when books tell me that I can't possibly have a moral compass or have morals at all without believing in God or without God existing regardless of my belief. And this book did that multiple times. I don't know if Sally Rooney is Catholic herself, but some of the characters are Catholic or Catholic adjacent. And the narrative that people who are non-religious can't have their own morals or that morals can't come to exist without a god is just so ridiculous to me and also deeply offensive as someone who happens to have morals without believing in the existence of a god that I just know. I reject the premise. Thank you very much. There was literally a passage that implied that anyone who is not a mass murderer has to believe in God on some level. Yeah, I wish I were joking. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not a fan of Sally Rooney's writing style, nor was I a fan of this novel in general. It felt deeply pointless, and I feel deeply cheated out of the time that I spent both listening to this audiobook and also raging about this audiobook, either internally or to my poor husband. Clearly, I don't feel that Beautiful World Where Are You deserved to win in this category. I gave it one star, begrudgingly. And while I wish I could pick one of the other nominees to be the winner instead, I actually haven't read any of the other nominees, but considering my experience with this book, I feel like literally any of them would have been better. I promise I won't talk so long about every single book, but this one was on another level. The amount of hatred that I feel, it's boundless. All right, moving on to the next category, we have best mystery and thriller. And the winner was The Last Thing He Told Me. And this is one that I hadn't really heard about, probably a couple times in passing, but I hadn't added it to my TBR before I decided to do this challenge. But when I read the description, it sounded interesting. So I was actually looking forward to reading it. And this is a story of unraveling the secrets of a man who has 
suddenly disappeared, leaving his new wife and his daughter to pick up the pieces. So I thought that this book was fine. I started off really not enjoying it. We are in this woman, Hannah's head, and the way that she thinks, or probably more accurately, the way this author writes is super repetitive. So here's just a little example of the way that this book is written. And you can see it's very halting. It makes it feel like you are inching forward so incredibly slowly. I don't answer him because he wants me to say yes. Yes, I'll let him protect me. Yes, I'll let him protect us. And I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say it because I know this much is true. He can't. Like the whole thing is like that where you start a sentence and then you backtrack a bit and pick up again and try to finish the sentence and then repeat the end of the last sentence and restate what you said in the last one, but slightly different. Here's another example. I watch her face as she tries to process that, this terrible, impossible thing the terrible, impossible thing he never wanted to say to her, the terrible, impossible thing I've been suspecting myself, the terrible, impossible thing I've known. It just feels very melodramatic and also just unnecessarily repetitive and irritating. <laughs> but I will say that halfway through that started to kind of drop away a little bit. I don't know if I started just skimming over those parts with my eyes <laughs> and ignoring them or if the author actually reduced the amount of repetition that she was writing at that point, who is to say? But I will say that in the second half, I found it easier to read. I was more into it probably. I think the pacing picked up a little bit more as well. I thought the plot was interesting, but I will say that the twists or the ending were a letdown for me. I just thought that it was probably one of the least interesting directions that the mystery could have gone. And I did enjoy the characters. I did enjoy the development of the relationship between Hannah and her stepdaughter, Bailey. But otherwise, I was just kind of left cold by this. So I thought this one was fine. Nothing special but also not the most horrific thing I've ever read in my life. I gave it two stars. And of the other nominees, I've actually read two of them. One is The Wife Upstairs by Rachel Hawkins, and the other one is The Good Sister by Sally Hepworth. And I did not like The Wife Upstairs, would not recommend. But The Good Sister was actually really, really good. I gave it four stars, would highly recommend. So if you read The Last Thing You Told Me and you were disappointed and wanted to read something else, but you weren't sure which of the nominees to go for, I'd recommend The Good Sister. And that was the one that I voted for and would have been my choice for the winner of the ones that I've read. So the next category is historical fiction. And this is a genre that I don't read particularly often. So this was a bit of an interesting experiment because Malibu Rising is not the kind of book that I ever would have picked up on my own. It takes place in the 80s and is telling the story of a famous family of surfers who are the children of a famous singer who abandoned them. And this story jumps back and forth between the history of their father and mother, how they came to meet and their early relationship. And when the children were still children and modern day over the course of a single night when they have a big house party where everything kind of falls apart. So for several reasons, I wasn't particularly interested in this novel. I don't really care about the 80s. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just don't find the decade particularly interesting. I also don't care about surfing or reading about rich and famous people who have parties full of drugs and alcohol and debauchery. Just not really my kind of thing. I also don't really really love reading about family drama and toxic familial relationships. So I went into this very skeptical thinking that I was just going to have to listen to it as fast as I could get through it. But I actually ended up enjoying this way more than I thought I would. And this is one of those books that I'm glad that I did this challenge and that I picked it up because I never would have otherwise, but I actually really enjoyed it. Now I will say I didn't love this book. I don't think it was a perfect book. It's not a favorite. I gave it three stars, but I did actually really enjoy the process of listening to it. And I really connected to the characters and felt invested in them. So is that a ringing endorsement? Probably not. But if you are more interested in these things that I am typically not drawn to, like the 80s, the rich and famous having big parties, surfing, family dynamics, then you'll probably enjoy this. I thought it was pretty well written and very easy to get through. The audiobook was well done. So yeah, pleasantly surprised. 
I'm fine to stand behind this one as a worthy winner of the award with the caveat that I have not read any of the other nominees, <laughs> so can't really compare it. Our next category is fantasy, and I did not read A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass for several reasons. <laughs> The first reason is that this is number four in a series, and while I have read the previous three books back when they were first published, I remember less than nothing about what happens, and I was not interested in A, rereading those to get up to speed, or B, trying to get through this without remembering any of the details of the earlier books. And the other reason is that I just have realized that while I could enjoy Sarah J. Mass's writing when I was in my late teens, early 20s, as an almost 30 year old human, I cannot, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> I cannot do it anymore. So I decided to spare myself the pain and just not read it. So unfortunately, I have no opinions to give on this one. Although I will say I read a couple of the other nominees and many more of them are on my TBR. So even though I have not read this book, my experience with Sarah J Mass makes it pretty clear to me that either The Inheritance of Orchidia Divina or Under the Whispering Door would have been more deserving of this win. But Sarah J Mass has hordes of rabid fans, mostly teenagers on TikTok. So she wins in the fantasy category every single year, not giving anyone else a chance, which is just too bad. So we're on to the next category, which is romance. And I have complicated feelings about romance as a genre. I really struggle with a lot of the common tropes in contemporary romance and also the way that characters and relationships are written in contemporary romance they just don't typically work for me. And in the last couple of years, I found a couple examples of a contemporary romance that I have really enjoyed. But unfortunately, those are typically the minority. If it weren't for this challenge, I never would have read this particular book. <laughs> so the winner of the romance category was People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. And it's a story of two best friends who have always gone on vacations together. And something has happened to complicate their relationship and now they're going on another vacation to see if they can mend their relationship after this rift with the implication that they're going to fall in love with each other. So I didn't find this premise particularly interesting and I didn't find the book particularly interesting either. The characters were pretty bland, the story itself didn't have a lot going for it, the title made no sense, in the context of the story, which is just a pet peeve of mine. And another pet peeve of mine, that the characters acted way younger than they're supposed to be. The best way I can describe this book is, you know that feeling when you meet somebody younger than you by at least a decade where you just feel so old when they talk to you? <laughs> and then they spend hours regaling you with every inside joke they've ever had with their best friend who you don't know and you just don't have the context at all. So you're just sitting there feeling so old and out of the loop and also bored out of your mind because these things that they're telling you that they think are like the funniest things that have ever happened in the world, you weren't there for and you have no context for. So they just are completely irrelevant to you. That's what this book felt like. <laughs> It was awful. So suffice to say, I did not enjoy this. I gave it one star. I read two of the other nominees, started a third, but I DNF'd it. We'll talk about that later. The two that I finished were One Last Stop and Actor Age Eve Brown, both of which I adored. So either one of those would have been, in my opinion, a much more worthy choice for the winner in this category. But that being said, I am not really much of a romance reader, so does my opinion in this count? Probably not, but it's my video, so I'll give it anyway. <laughs> Moving on to our next category, and this category is my favorite genre to read, which is science fiction. And the winner of the science fiction category was Andy Weir's Project Hail Mary. I've never read anything written by Andy Weir, so I cannot compare this to his previous works. I know that he is very famous for The Martian, I've never read it and I've never seen the movie. So, okay, let me explain what this book is first. So this is the story of our protagonist who wakes up on a ship in the middle of outer space. He does not know who he is or how he got there or what he's supposed to be doing. And the story progresses as he starts to regain his memories and try to save all of humanity. And I hated this book. I 
hated this so much. This book is really up there battling Beautiful World Where Are You for the book I have hated most in my entire life. I think this one was extra upsetting because I was really looking forward to reading it. I had heard so many good things from sci-fi lovers. I have heard so many good things about Andy Weir in general. I love sci-fi. I was most excited to read the sci-fi winner out of any of the winners. So maybe the hype in general and also the hype in my own brain is part of the reason why this crashed and burned so hard for me. How do I even go about describing how much I hated this? I have extensive notes from reading it because it was just that bad, in my opinion. I think the thing that bothers me most about this book is that it feels like it was written for children or just that the author is treating its adult readers as if they were children by being super condescending. In talking about this book with some other people, I've likened it to watching the Magic School Bus, except that instead of the amazing and incredible Miss Frizzle, it's our Gary Sue, who is apparently the most genius man to have ever existed, and talks as if his brain is just a database of memes and top-voted Reddit comments. And if that sounds confusing and slightly unsettling, correct. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I just hated the protagonist. I felt he was so irritating. He was such a Gary Sue in that he was the smartest and the best at everything. He was able to solve any problem regardless of what it was or how huge in scale. He was treated as though he was the most important scientist on earth, even though he was a middle school science teacher. Not that there's anything wrong with being a middle school science teacher, but there are people who have spent their entire careers focusing in different areas of science who have much more expertise to share than someone who has been focusing on teaching a broad range of subjects at a beginner level for most of his career. Examples of his unbelievable intelligence are learning an alien language in under a week. And before anyone comments to tell me that he didn't learn the language, he, he created a computer program to translate it to use as a database, yes. But then he repeatedly says that he doesn't need the database anymore after like two weeks because apparently he just has that big of a brain. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. He also doesn't swear because he's a middle school teacher. So there's a lot of, oh, I'm so pooped throughout this book, which adds even more to that feeling that I'm reading a children's book. He also feels so deeply and irritatingly American in the most stereotypical way. I'm not even gonna to touch on how stereotypical all the other characters were because there are some really uncomfortable and dare I say problematic <laughs> depictions of people from different countries and of different identities in this book that were just laughable. I can speak to the Canadian, particularly as a Canadian myself, just such a caricature of Canadians that felt completely unnecessary. Here's an example of his deeply Americanness. Yes, inches, when I'm stressed out, I revert to imperial units. It's hard to be an American, okay? Like, I know I'm supposed to find that funny, but I just don't. Here's another example. I tie a quick slip knot in the tether and throw it at the antenna, and I'll be gosh darned, I nailed it. I just wrangled an alien spaceship. Again, feels like he's maybe a teenage boy, or this is written for children who spend too much time on the internet to enjoy. I just felt like it was not at all aimed at me as a reader. And I've seen so many people talk about how they love this book because it's hard sci-fi. It's got so much of the science, it's science first. And I really felt like while yes, they talk about a lot of the science in more detail than some other sci-fi novels, he talks about specific equations. It felt like listening to someone recite a textbook. It didn't feel integrated into the story at all. And as, some scientists who are much smarter than me have pointed out there's still much of the science that doesn't make particular sense and is not accurate. I enjoy hard sci-fi, but I want to hear the science explained in a way that serves the narrative. I don't want someone to explain each step of the equation or each step of the chemical process for every tiny thing that happens throughout the entire story. It just feels like filler at that point or that the author felt that he had to include it because he spent the time researching it and didn't want it to go to waste. I don't know. It didn't serve the story. For me, this was a complete miss. I gave it one star. I was very disappointed in it. I also felt like the story itself, the plot itself, 
outside of the writing style and the characters was just not interesting enough to carry everything else that was happening. I found the premise, the way that the story was set up, very irritating and kind of lazy. There was a lot of last minute main character remembering some vital piece of information at exactly the right period of time, even though he'd been in an extended coma and had severe memory loss that just felt too easy and convenient, especially as it happened over and over again. This was just not for me. As for the other nominees, <laughs> I've read a couple of them. Clara and the Sun, Winter's Orbit, Remote Control, and A Psalm for the Wild Built. And out of those, my favorite was Winter's Orbit, so that would be my pick. But honestly, all four of those, significantly better. I would even hesitate to say light years better <laughs> than Project Hail Mary. So if any of those four had won, I would have been satisfied. It honestly feels like a travesty that Project Hail Mary won out over those four books because it just not even remotely on the same level. How many unpopular opinions has that been so far in this video? Am I being massacred in the comments yet? <laughs> Okay, moving on to the next category, we have horror, which is a category that I have gotten more into in the last couple years. I really enjoy reading horror. So the winner in the horror category was The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix. And I'd actually never read anything by Grady Hendrix up until earlier in the month when I read one of his other books, which was The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which was okay. I didn't love it. I had quite a few issues with it. This one, I liked even less. So this is the story of a literal support group for final girls who have survived horror movie-esque, slasher-esque massacres, basically. And this book starts in one of those titular final girl support groups when they discover that one of their group has been murdered and they realize that someone is out to get them. And... This didn't work for me for many reasons. I really disliked the narration. I didn't like the narrator at all, and I didn't like the way that the story was told through the narrator. I don't think I enjoy the way that Grady Hendrix writes female characters after having read two of his books, and I do wish that he, as well as other male authors like Riley Sager, would stop writing books that have an almost entirely female cast because they're just not good at writing women and I don't want to read female characters that are badly written by men. Why do we continue to be subjected to this? And there's also the fact that this story has some racist undertones, and there were racist undertones in the other book I read by Grady Hendrix as well, which is really causing me to side-eye this author. In this book, the Black character is killed off first, and she gets zero page time, and later dynamics that have to do with this character just add to the ickiness of how she was portrayed for no reason whatsoever. Didn't have to be told that way. I also felt like in general, this book was super slow. The pacing just dragged. It took so long for anything interesting to happen. And when the interesting things did happen, it just felt like there was no real impact, that there were not really any stakes. It just didn't do it for me. It left me completely cold. So I gave it one star, not a fan. I don't think I'll read anything else from Grady Hendrix at this point. Doesn't seem like he's an author for me. I have read a couple of the other books from the nominees in the horror category. Dowry of Blood, My Heart is a Chainsaw, All's Well, and Comfort Me with Apples. And of those four, my personal pick would be Comfort Me with Apples. It's a novella, very quick to get through, very weird and unique highly recommend. More creepy and eerie than outright scary. It's not gory or anything, so if you're a bit of a scaredy cat, you might still enjoy it. And the other three, while I didn't love them as much, I think I gave all three of the others three stars, they were still much better than the Final Girl Support Group. So again, as much as my choice would be Comfort Me With Apples, any of those four would have been a better pick, in my opinion, than the Final Girls Support Group. On a more positive note, moving over to the humor category, the winner in the humor category was Broken in the Best Possible Way by Jenny Lawson. And I don't typically read humor, I just find that I don't typically find them funny. <laughs> I feel like I have a very particular sense of humor, I guess, and there's a lot of things that just don't make me laugh whatsoever. So without this challenge, I would not have been particularly incentivized to read this book. Though I will say I was given an influencer copy of the audiobook of this 
from Libro FM, which is an awesome service. If you don't know them, it's a service where you can buy audiobooks while supporting local bookshops. It's really awesome. I'll link them down in the description box. But they gave me an influencer copy for review. And because they gave me a copy, I looked at the synopsis and it sounded really interesting. So this one was actually on my TBR, but I don't actually know when I would have gotten around to it if it weren't for this challenge. And I am so glad that this was the winner and I read it for this because I absolutely adored this book. And I'm going to go out and read everything that Jenny Lawson has ever written because I don't know if I've ever laughed and cried so much at a work of nonfiction. This was so relatable to me on such a deep level in so many ways. And I would go from laughing out loud and my cheeks hurting from smiling so much to literally sobbing on the floor. You think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. <laughs> this book hit me so hard in all the feels. And while it covered a lot of really serious and intense and upsetting topics, it also just had such a beautiful undercurrent of hope and levity and love and camaraderie. And it was just so lovely. So if you have not read anything by Jenny Lawson, please do. Please read this book. I can't speak to any of her other work because I haven't read it, but if it is even a fraction of what this book is, then it is so worth your time. I'm obsessed. I love it. 10 stars out of five, if that were a thing. I haven't read any of the other nominees, so I can't speak to them, but I honestly cannot think of a way that any of them would be better than this book, <laughs> for me anyway. So I'm very happy that this book won, much deserved in my opinion, and I'm very happy to have something positive to say about one of these winners. Moving on to the next category, which is nonfiction, and the winner in this category was The Anthropocene Reviewed by John Green. And this is actually the first time I've read anything by John Green. All I know about him is that he's a famous YouTuber, he has a twin brother who is also a famous YouTuber, and that he writes books that are very popular. <laughs> That's all I have. But when I read about this book, I thought it sounded really interesting and I was looking forward to reading it. And I'm glad that it was the winner because I really enjoyed this. I thought this was such a creative way to structure a nonfiction work of this kind. I felt that while some of the entries were less poignant, for me particularly, so many of them really were quite touching in one way or another. And while the book is not laugh out loud funny in the way that Broken was, I did feel like it contained quite a bit of truth and vulnerability. And I found it very relatable, especially in the ways that John Green was talking about the experience of the pandemic and struggling with mental health. A few of the entries in particular really stood out to me as just incredibly well done. While this isn't a favorite book of all time by any means, I really enjoyed it and I gave it four stars. And I think I'm going to recruit my husband to listen to this with me on audio at some point because I think he would enjoy it as well. And I think I would enjoy listening to it again. I haven't read any of the other nominees, so I can't compare it to any of them, but I think that at least on its own merit, it is deserving of winning best nonfiction. Moving on to our next category, memoir and autobiography. I am not a huge memoir reader. I do read them occasionally, but I find I really have to be in the right mindset to enjoy a memoir or an autobiography. But the winner of this category, Crying in H Mart, has been on my TBR for at least six months, and I have been meaning to read it. So it's another one that I'm really glad was part of this challenge because this is another one that I really enjoyed. This is an autobiography or memoir of the author Michelle, who is a Korean American musician. And this story addresses her experience of grief and loss after her mother's cancer diagnosis and later her mother's death. I thought it was very well written, very poignant. I was completely pulled into it. I think I listened to it in a single day and definitely got very emotional at several times throughout. I always find it hard to read stories that explore grief because it just brings up all of those feelings. But there was definitely an undercurrent of not joy so much as peace and the feeling that she was going to be okay, that the author was growing into the person she was always meant to be. And while that growth can be incredibly painful, it can also be so beautiful and transformative. And I felt hopeful for her. I would highly recommend this if you haven't read it yet. I can't compare it to any of the other memoirs that were nominated because I haven't read any of them, although I have added a few to my TBR to read at some point in the future. But I definitely think that Crying in H Mart deserved to win this category just on its own merit. It was really beautifully done. 
Our next category is a genre that I pretty much never read, which is history and biography. I am not big on nonfiction history, even though they often explore issues and time periods and people that I find interesting. They also tend to be written in a way that puts me to sleep <laughs> in my own personal experience. So I must say I was not looking forward to reading this one. I had never heard of the Sackler family and I knew very little about where this book was going to go, but I was actually so pleasantly surprised by this. I found it absolutely fascinating. I thought it was so well written. It was probably the easiest experience of reading a novel like this that I've ever had in my life, even though this was exploring people I'd never heard of and subjects that I'd never really been exposed to. I felt like the author did such a good job of telling this very complex web of a story and really keeping a through line that kept me interested and engaged throughout. And while there were definitely sections of the book where I felt he probably could have cut out some of the information, I never felt myself getting bored by the extra information. I didn't find myself losing focus or getting distracted, which is kind of shocking considering how long this is and the subject matter and the fact that I knew nothing about it beforehand and had no particular interest in learning about this family. I was so drawn in and I would definitely recommend it. I just finished it and I've already recommended it to several of my friends and family. I think it was really great and I'm planning on reading more by this author because he did an amazing job. So this is another category where I have not read any of the other nominees so I can't speak to them but as far as this book on its own, Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty, this book was great, very well done, and definitely deserving of the recognition that it's getting. On to the next category, which is graphic novels and comics. I don't read a lot of graphic novels or comics. I don't have anything against them. I just don't read them very often. So I had never heard of Laura Olympus, the winner in this category, before picking up this challenge. But in reading about it, it sounded really interesting and I thought the cover was really beautiful and the art looked like it was really nice. So I got myself a physical copy. Sadly, I didn't really enjoy this. And I don't know if it's because it is actually a webtoon that's been turned into sort of the first volume of a graphic novel. I've never read a webtoon, so I, I don't know, maybe all webtoons are like this and I'm just not the intended audience of a webtoon. I just felt like this didn't really do very much. It's a retelling of Hades and Persephone in a sort of marginally contemporary setting, although they are still actual gods in this retelling. They're not human. This is not a huge volume, but it's not insignificant. And I just felt like nothing really happened. There wasn't a lot of plot. The characters didn't really stand out to me too much. Yeah, I guess there just wasn't really anything to hook me or make me interested in this. I liked the art style for the most part, although I will say that I didn't love the over-sexualization of the female characters. The way that they were drawn and the way that they were written was a little icky to me. It also felt like this was aimed at teenagers, but from what I can tell, it's actually aimed at adults. And it's another one where I just feel like it's written very young for what it is. And especially considering the subject matter, it feels inappropriately young, maybe infantilizing of the female characters is the right way to put it. It just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth, um, the way that the characters and some of the subject matter was handled. And other than that, there wasn't really anything going for it. So sadly, this was a miss for me. I don't plan on reading any more from this series. I might try to pass this on. Maybe I'll donate it to my library or something. I don't really understand all the people <laughs> leaving reviews saying it's the best Hades and Persephone retelling they've ever read in their lives. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe it gets way better after volume one, but I will never find out because I'm not going to read it. <laughs> so that was this category. I haven't read any of the other nominees, so I can't speak to them, but this one unfortunately was a miss for me. Moving on to the next category, which is poetry. And this is one that I had read previous to deciding to do this challenge. The winner was The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman, which was the poem that she wrote for the inauguration of Joe Biden in the United States. And I watched the inauguration on TV and thought that it was beautiful at the time. I was incredibly moved. And when I got a Libro FM influencer copy and I listened to it again, I was just as moved as the first time. Although I will say, if you have not seen Amanda Gorman perform this poem, I would recommend finding a video of her at the inauguration because her facial expressions and her hand gestures and 
the tone of her voice, the whole package was really spectacular. And while the audiobook is amazing, it still does not live up to her performance at the inauguration itself. So I thought this was amazing. I gave it five stars. I loved it. I have not read any of the other nominees in this category, so I can't say if any of them were better, but I did really, really love this poem. So I am glad that she's getting so much recognition because she's clearly very talented. Next category was best debut novel, and the winner was the Spanish Love Deception. Sadly, this was the only book of this challenge that I ended up DNFing. I got three chapters in and then I couldn't continue. <laughs> and reading one and two star reviews reinforced that that was probably the right decision for me. So this is a contemporary romance with all the tropes that you could possibly want. Enemies to lovers, fake dating, going to a wedding together, all things that I typically dislike reading about. So I was already very apprehensive going into this. I probably could have gotten through it if it just contain tropes that I'm not the biggest fan of, although I'm not sure I would have enjoyed it. But my main issue was the writing. I just felt that it was not particularly well written and reading reviews of people who read the whole thing, it seems like that was an ongoing issue. It was one of the last books that I was reading out of all of these and I'd already had to subject myself to quite a few hate reads <laughs> for this video and I just didn't want to do it to myself again. So I decided to DNF it. I think that was the best choice for me personally. Looking at the rest of the nominees, I would have loved if either Firekeeper's Daughter or Winter's Orbit had won in this category. I thought both of those were so 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 well done and I loved both of them. Although Firekeeper's Daughter did win in our next Next category, so maybe Winter's Orbit should have gotten this one. So moving into the next category, which was Young Adult Fiction, and the winner was Firekeeper's Daughter. This is another one that I read before deciding to do this challenge, and I loved this book. It is sort of a mystery thriller YA focused on an Indigenous teenager who witnesses a murder. And before I read this, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I was actually really blown away by this novel. I ended up loving it. I thought it was really well done, well written. The characters jump off the page. They feel so real and they feel their actual age, which is such a breath of fresh air when it comes to YA. This novel explores several really difficult topics like drug abuse and sexual assault and racism. So it's definitely one that I would recommend checking out trigger content warnings before getting started just to kind of prepare yourself but I would highly recommend this and I'm very glad that this book is being recognized. I've read a couple of the other nominees in this category. The Project, Perfect on Paper, Honey and Issues Guide to Fake Dating, Yoke and She Drives Me Crazy. Of all of the other nominees that I've read, my favorite was probably She Drives Me Crazy. Although I will say that Firekeeper's Daughter was definitely my favorite out of all the ones I read, so I'm very glad that it won. We've reached the penultimate category, Young Adult Fantasy. The winner in this category was Rule of Wolves by Lee Bardugo. And this was the other book that was part of a series. So I did not read it, cannot speak to it. I have read a couple of the other nominees though, Six Crimson Cranes and The Ones We're Meant to Find, both of which I loved. If I had to just pick one favorite of those two, I would probably pick Six Crimson Cranes, if only because I would categorize The Ones We're Meant to Find as sci-fi, not fantasy. Although there isn't a young adult sci-fi category, so I guess I understand why they put them together here, but I probably would have liked to see Six Crimson Cranes win in this category. All right, we finally reached the final category here, which is middle grade and children's. And the winner was Daughter of the Deep by Rick Riordan. I've never read anything by Rick Riordan, so I don't have any particular attachment to him as an author. I don't have any nostalgia for his style of writing. So I kind of came into this completely fresh with no bias. As of the time that I'm filming this, I'm about halfway through the audiobook and I'm enjoying it so far. I'll pop something up on the screen with my final thoughts once I've finished it because I will have finished it before I finish editing this video, but I did want to get this video out to all of you, so I decided to film it even though I wasn't quite done listening. Unless the ending really goes off the rails, I'm sure I'll enjoy it because I've enjoyed the first half so far. So that brings us to the end of this challenge. Those are all the books that won the 2021 Goodreads Choice Awards and my thoughts on them. I hope you enjoyed this video. I suffered through quite a bit of pain. <laughs> 
and emotional turmoil in completing this challenge, but I'm glad I did it because I did find a couple books that I was really surprised to love. And it also pushed me to read some of the books that I had on my TBR a lot sooner than I would have otherwise. So all in all, I think it was a positive experience, even though there were a number of books in there that are not for me, to put it mildly. I would love to hear your thoughts on these books if you've read any of them. Please leave a comment down below with your opinions, whether you agree with me or not. I would love to hear more thoughts on all of these books. If you made it all the way to the end, leave some sort of book emoji in the comments so I know you're a real one. Before I go, I wanna take a quick second to thank my patrons for their support. Extra special thanks to our newest patrons, Kat, Kira, Silver, Julia, Jennifer, Daphne, Leah, Anna and Lucretia. Welcome all of you to the squad. We are so excited to have you. If you at home want to join the squad, feel free. There's a link in the card and in the description box down below. Thank you again to Anna Luisa for sponsoring this video. Don't forget they're having a buy one, get one 40% off sale for Valentine's Day. So check out the link in the description box and in the pinned comment to treat yourself and a loved one to the perfect Valentine's Day gift. And with that, I'm going to get going. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you real soon in my next one. Bye friends.